Okay. Uh, last week, for those of you that were here, know that last week I gave, I shared with you the kingdom vision that God had given me for uh, North Glen for this year and beyond. Today we're going to begin a new journey, and this being the first Sunday of the year, we are going to uh, do a new sermon series entitled Kingdom Disciples. And, and this is one of the goals that I told you about Sunday, that I want to see us grow and mature in our walk with Jesus. And I don't know about you guys, but this first, you know, we're only into one week for 2018, and it's been, it's been a rough start for a lot of us. I know this because a lot of people, I've, been t I've talked to a lot of people and, you know, they share with me some things going on in their life. Even at my work, there's some, uh, some people that are going through some really rough times. Uh, my shop steward even said to me that he said he's had like 18 people in the, come to him with, that are going through some severe problems in, the, you know, w between the church and, I mean, not church, between the work or personal life. But, um... We might want to get them a little quiet over there. But our focus this year is going to be Matthew 6.33. So um, even in my post for um, Facebook, I've been putting good Matthew 33 morning. Because the reason I'm putting that is because just a reminder of what this year is about. And, and I even posted this morning as I was taking a shower... And I was just um, thinking about a lot of different things. And God, I felt like he tapped me on the shoulder and, and reminded me of Matthew 6.33 to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And I'm telling you, I don't know what you're going through. I don't, it, 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 and it could be, there's some serious things going on with people I know. But I believe when Jesus says something, I believe he says it for a reason. I believe he says it because he loves us. And I believe he says it because he wants to see us live the abundant life. And it's, this life is a, is a hard life. I, I even had one Christian yesterday come up to me and tell me how hard it is to live for Jesus. And I said, yes, and it doesn't get any easier. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rough life, but we go in it and at it through the power of Christ. And, and, and again, as I said on the, the post this morning, we have a choice to put our focus on the problem or the problem solver. Our problems can, can get bigger and bigger, but our problem solver is Jesus Christ, and he, he can overcome anything. Amen? And I uh, just want to share with you, when, I, when uh, I know me, Joe, and Barry went to the men's conference. It's getting warm in here already. When, when me and Barry... And Joe went to the men's conference. We got to see Tony Evans. And back in October, I need help. help. <laughs> I can't dress myself, undress myself. It's this, it's this thing here. Okay. Okay. I think I got it now. All right. But we went to go to this, uh, men whoa, I'm back. Where is this going? We went to this men, men's conference and uh, got to see Tony Evans. And through, through that time, it really inspired me because I, he, he, he did a sermon. And I'm going to actually be doing the same scripture sermon that he did. And I'm going to be using some of uh, his, one of his, one of his illustrations that I want to actually read to you so I don't mess it up because um, I'm not that good at. So I want to just read to you. Um, this little illustration here, and how many remember the Titanic? Well, not that you were there, but you remember the story about the Titanic. I don't think any of us was there. Okay, one of the greatest tragedies of the 20th century was the sinking of the Titanic in the chilly North Atlantic Ocean on April 15th. What year was it? 1912. Yes, you got it. Over 1,500 people died in the frigid waters of the Atlantic during the maiden voyage of this elegant ship that was be believed to be unsinkable. The cause of the catastrophe is commonly understood to be the ship's hull being ripped open by a largely submerged iceberg. But the tragedy occurred primarily because of a lesser known yet more strategic reason. David Blair was the second in command scheduled to make the journey from Southampton, England, 
to America. However, on the day before the scheduled departure, Mr. Blair was reassigned. Mr. Mr. Blair had in his pocket the key to the crow's nest locker, which contained the high-powered binoculars that were used to the crew member who watched from the elevated crow's nest for any potential dangers. Because Mr. Blair inadvertently kept the key with him, the binoculars were unavailable at the moment that they were needed most. Thus, the iceberg was not visible at the distance as it would have been with the, had the binoculars been available. The alt this ultimately led to the deadly crash we know as the sinking of the Titanic. If it wasn't for the missing key, the tragedy could have been averted. So, I tell you that because we're going to talk about today the missing key and um, the missing key in our culture and in the church. And it is a critical key. It's a, it's a very critical key. And it is, uh, it can make a kingdom difference and it can make a difference in our lives. But, but the problem is this missing key is missing in the church too. And what is that key that we're talking about? Does anybody know what key we're talking about? The missing key is discipleship. Discipleship. And Jesus has, especially in the churches, he has a big fan club. Big fan club. And uh, millions of people respect his name, but there are just a few disciples. Because there's a difference between being a Christian and a disciple. There is a difference because not all Christians are disciples, as we're going to see here. But um, we're going to be looking at what it means to be a kingdom, kingdom disciple from, of course, from where? The Word of God, of course. And in the absence of kingdom disciples, that is contributing to the chaos that is in within the culture here. And this missing key is so vital for us to make an impact on this world for Jesus Christ. So I want us to look at, you can turn your Bibles or you can um, look on the screen at Matthew 28. And we're going to be looking at 16, verses 16 through 20. And I just want to let you know that um, I wrote in my Bible here, I, I dated it and wrote it at the bottom of this scripture, 10:28:17. The role of a pastor is not to grow a big church. The pastor's role is to, is to grow mature disciples who make disciples. And that's really what my goal is, is to um, make disciples. And, and uh, so let's look at the scripture here. And, we, and everybody knows this as the Great Commission that um, Jesus gave us here in the, in the end of this Matthew. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you. We praise you, Lord, as we come together, Lord. We come together in, in your holy name, Jesus. And we come together uh, to be uh, in your presence here, Lord, today, Lord. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for your your word for commissioning us commissioning commissioning your church the call that you've put on your church lord and lord jesus we just ask you to move in our hearts lord and take us from where we are to where we need to be as kingdom disciples lord that that, that this church would raise up kingdom disciples lord and we would be uh, just uh, fulfilling the great commission that you've commanded us to do as a church lord so lord jesus move in our hearts lord take us out of our comfort zone take us from where the things that comfort us so much that we we just will not step out lord just uh let your scripture speak to us today in jesus name we pray amen when jesus rose from the dead he called for a meeting here and in this meeting this, was, this meeting was in between his re, his, uh, when he resurrected and his ascension, which was 40 days. He walked the earth for 40 days after his crucifixion and his resurrection. So for them, 40, 40 days, this is the only part in the Bible where he called a meeting. 
And when he called this meeting, there were three groups that attended this meeting. If you look in Matthew 28, 16, it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. So the eleven disciples were there. And if you look at, we're not going to go there, but in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, it says that more than 500 believers were there also. And then it also says at the end of, if you look at the verse 20, at the end of it, it says, at the end of it, it says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Well, the end of the age hasn't came yet. So he's speaking to all of us too. So we're all invited to this meeting. And this is a meeting that Jesus had. And he realized that without the full use of this discipleship, with this key of discipleship, followers of Jesus lack the tools needed to, be, to fully represent Jesus here on earth. His heaven representation that we have down here on earth. And that's what we're called to do. Jesus, as I've told you before, I still remember, my, di my father died a long time ago, and I still remember his last words when he told me to take care of your mother. And Jesus, these are his last words to, to us. And they're very important. The, the last thing, Jesus felt this was vital importance, and I think this is, this is what's really um, needed in the church here. But kingdom disciples are in such a short supply it has resulted in powerless Christians. Sometimes we're powerless. Attending powerless churches resulting in a powerless presence that impacts the world. We, 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 we should be making an impact in the world. This church, even this church, no, I don't care how big we are or how small, we can make an impact for our community and for the world. You've got to believe that, that one person, you and me, can make a difference in this world. We can. Don't let Satan think, well, I'm just one person. No, you're an important person because as a, just like yesterday, I, had a, I, went to, I don't usually work on Saturday, but I worked this Saturday, and I'm glad I did because I got to meet a, a new guy at the job who, who proudly told me he was an atheist, and not in an arrogant way, but, and he was asking me questions. He's very interested in um, Christianity. He said there's three things that... I'm gonna. My, he's, there's three things that I'm interested in in this life. One is religion. Two is serial killers, and I honestly cannot remember what the third one was because them two were enough for me. I, um, but 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 with the religion part, he says the reason I'm interested is because I asked the question why. He wanted to know why. So he is, and, and I was talking to another Christian that works with him on night shift. And he has been sharing uh, his faith with him. And I recommended him, that, those of you know, uh, Lee Strobel, who wrote the book, The Case for Christ, who was also an atheist. And he went out to prove that, that Christianity was not real. And I haven't seen the movie yet, but I heard the movie's really good. I see a thumb going up. So if you get a chance, check out that movie of Lee Strobel and his life story. I think he's got a documentary and a movie. But the more recent one was the movie. But a kingdom disciple can be, de be defined as a believer in Jesus who takes part in the spiritual development. Because how many know that it, we're growing? This spiritual development takes time. It's a process of progressively learning to live all of life in submission to Jesus Christ. Now that's a lot. To, to live our, all our lives to the submission of Jesus Christ. But there is a desperate need in the church for committed followers of Jesus. I know this sounds weird. You know what I'm talking about here. I mean, we do not have enough committed followers of Jesus Christ. Kingdom disciples are in short supply. They really are. They're in short supply. Look at Matthew 6.10. 6, Matthew 6.10 says, this is part of, um, again, the Sermon on the Mount, but... Uh, your kingdom come, when he was telling them how to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we see here that according to Jesus, a disciple's first concern should be to know the will of the Father, to know the will of God. And, and that should be in, very important to you. Because as it says here, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How many understand in heaven... His will is being done. Okay, and he wants that same thing down here on earth. And, 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 and so we have to, to learn what it means to be a disciple. So what is a disciple? 
A disciple is, is a person who has decided that following Jesus, Christ takes precedence over everything and anything. It is number one priority. That's why I seek first the kingdom of God. A disciple looks and acts like the one he or she is following. We should be looking like that. I want to share with you, I, I'm not kidding. I, I was talking to my son today. He sat down and I'm talking to him. And, and I don't get the chance to talk to him much because he's, between the two of us, we're, we're, our paths don't cross much. I'm sitting there looking at him and he's talking to me and I'm like, wow. I seen a picture of me. I never realized how much he looks like I looked when I was 19 years old. His hair, he's got a mustache and beard now. And I'm like, I looked at him and I seen a reflection of myself. It even freaked me out a little bit. I got to be honest with you. I've never seen that. This is my son. I've... I, for 19 years, I've never seen him look so much like me. I look like, even the eyes, everything, I'm looking at him like, I even, I didn't even, I even interrupted him. I said, Chad, I can't get over how much you look like me when I was 19. So, but that's the way we're supposed to look like Jesus. That when people see us, they're just like, wow, you look like Jesus. You know, don't you want to look like Jesus? Don't you want to have that same kind of attitude that Jesus had? Because Jesus even said, it even says to have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. So, I, 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 I want to tell you what uh, the goal of discipleship, if you look at um, Romans 8.29. Romans 8.29. This is, this is the goal of of discipleship for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers we need to be conformed to the image of his son that we reflect him when we look in the mirror man i've never looked in the mirror and seen jesus i just see me and i want to see jesus i want to see so much of his reflection when i look in the mirror i've never got there yet but don't wouldn't that be nice like, I got that, I, there's a reason why Jesus allowed me to see my son like I've never seen him before in 19 years today. I don't know why, but for some reason, maybe it's because um, the fact that I'm trying to be like Jesus, and, and I don't look nothing like him right now, and I desperately want to look like Jesus, and I know you do too, but, but I would love to get that same reflection looking in the mirror one day and just like, Wow, Jesus is all over you. You ever met somebody? I've met people like that. Where, in fact, the, the last person I met was a security guard. Never met her before. She was sitting in the desk. I came in in the morning. She had this smile on her face, and I, I said good morning to her. And I, and, she, and I stopped, and I said, you know Jesus, don't you? She said, yes, I do. She said, how would you know? I said, it, he's all over you. I see him all over you. And, and I've, I've seen that with a truck driver before. The, a truck driver came to my work before, and I said the same thing. And that's one of the greatest compliments I think you can get. But she stopped me dead in my truck. It wasn't that she was a beautiful woman. That's not what it was. I've seen Jesus on her. So there is beauty in that, isn't there? Amen. I don't care what she looks like. But, that, but I've seen Jesus. The, and, and that's what we, we, we need to have people see us like that. Look at 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we will, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So, isn't that a, ain't that an awesome spirit, a scripture here? The glory of the Lord, are, we are being transformed into the same image. As Jesus Christ. Jesus has a plan for, this, for making disciples. And as Jesus, as only Jesus can do, he makes it so simple a child can understand it. So we're going to give you, I'm going to give you, uh, we're going to take a close look at, at Jesus' three-step plan to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. All right, and we're going to, it's in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Let's read that again. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
And here's Jesus' three-step plan that anybody in this church can do. Number one, go to the people. Go. Go to the people. Okay, the first of the three things we need to do is to make disciples involves going. It, it means we're actually going to have to be proactive to go and, and seek out these people, right? As you go make disciples, in other words, Jesus expects us to be going out because I, I love the way what, what Tony Evans says about you can look at the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic of, the, of what the meaning of go is, but the meaning of go is go. You go. You don't stay. You can't stay. We can't stay here. As I said last week, and again, Tony Evans' illustration, this is a huddle. We're huddled around, and we're in a huddle right now, and we're going to break out, and we're going to go out there, and we're going to make a difference out there. That's, what, that's why we huddle together today, because we're going to put application to God's Word. We're not just going to hear it. We're going to do it. We're going to be doers of the Word. Amen? What Jesus is talking about here is the ministry of Okay, get, hold your ears, because this is going to be a cuss word to some of you. Evangelism. Evangelism. He actually wants us to evangelize. All of us. Not just the pastor, not just the leaders, but every one of us has been called to evangelize. To share the good news of Jesus Christ. You got a testimony. I got a testimony to what Jesus did that right there is a great starting point of what Jesus did for you. How you came to know him as Lord and Savior. Amen? But you can't make disciples out of unrepentant sinners. Okay? They must repent and they can only do that when they hear the gospel message. Somebody was bold enough and brave enough to come to this, this crazy guy who was nuts in the world, crazy... And present Jesus Christ, the gospel message, and show me something different that I didn't have. That that, that that person knew that I desperately needed, that you desperately needed. But Christians, you are not doing the work of the church if you are not winning souls to Jesus Christ. And being a public witness to the message of the gospel. I know, again, this is not something you really want to hear. But listen to Proverbs 11.30. Proverbs 11.30, I know you've heard this before, but the fruit of the righteous is a tr the tree of life, and the one who is wise saves lives. Saves souls is a better, better uh, interpretation. But we must keep evangelism front and center in the life of the church. This is Jesus, these, this is Jesus' marching order for, the, for his church. If we're not doing this, then we're not fulfilling what he's called this church to, be, to do and be. If the church is to grow by making disciples, it, its people must be willing to go and be a witness to the world. You, we have to be a witness to the world. And again, the, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons Jesus sent the Holy Spirit was because of Acts 1.8. 8. Listen to this. Acts 1.8, this is, this is powerful. And I know you're familiar with this verse too. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And listen to what you do. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. We are to be a witness for Jesus Christ. And you can do that and have boldness of that because of the Holy Spirit living in you. It doesn't matter what people think about you. It really doesn't. It doesn't matter. You, we got to get over of uh, the rejection and, 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 and people not... How, how would you like it if you... Okay, if you had a choice to be rejected or maybe that one person, maybe you get rejected 59 out of 60 times, but that one time, that one soul, man, they ju it's just what they needed to hear. They needed to hear the gospel message. They needed to hear about Jesus Christ and, and you made an impact and a difference in their lives. Wouldn't it be worth 59 rejections to get that one that comes to Jesus Christ? Amen. Evangelism can be described as sharing the good news. It's good news. Everybody wants good news. We got enough bad news out here. We got the good news of Jesus Christ and what he can do. So we have good news of Jesus about his substitutionary death and resurrection. We, we can share that with them. And his free offer of forgiveness. Wow. Who doesn't want to be forgiven? I mean, I know I need it 
daily, and I know most of you do, all of you do, forgiveness of sin and eternal life. He offers eternal life to all who come to Him by faith and receive it. That's what we have to offer people. That's good news, church. We don't want to hold back the good news, do we? Just because somebody might put their hand up at us, or they might say, I don't want to hear about that stuff. You go take that somewhere else. Okay, fine. But I'm going to keep praying for you, buddy, because you need Jesus. Just like I told them Jehovah Witnesses when they were had enough of me. When they, I told them, I, I care about your souls because Jesus, you need a relationship. You need to give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. It's not about a religion or, or I'll call it a cult. It's not about a cult. It's not following a cult. It's about following a relationship with Jesus Christ. And He is the only one that can save us because He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, no one comes to the Father. No one comes to God except through Jesus Christ. So, amen. But the church must, and this is on me and, and the leaders, and, and, but we must challenge you. I'm challenging you today. And we must equip you, okay, and, it, it, and if, to effectively share your faith with unbelievers. And, and we desperately need evangelism training in this church. Desperately. Number two. The first one is go. The second one is help people identify with Jesus. Jesus said, look, look at here. Jesus said another part of making disciples is baptizing those who have, have gone after and have accepted Jesus as our personal Savior. Baptism. The primary meaning of the Greek word for baptism is identification it identifies you with jesus christ and i i often read this when i do baptisms romans 6 i just want to show this again romans 6 3 through 5 this is really what a picture of what baptism is and here it is do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into christ jesus were baptized into his death that's the part when we go down it's it's a it's a bearing of the old life where we were buried therefore with him by baptism in, into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Because we were raised up. When we come out of them baptismal waters, it's not just about getting wet. It's about dying to self and raising up and identifying with that I am a, 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 a follower of Jesus Christ. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall, cert shall, it's a promise, shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We, we have risen, man, we, we, you know, Satan wants to beat us down so bad. You know, he's trying to beat me down. This first week has been a tough start to the year. As optimistic as I've tried to be all year, and, 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 I've, and Satan has, has been like a monkey on my back. But you know what? I keep quoting Matthew 6.33, as far as, i got to keep reminding myself daily, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these other things, they'll be taken care of. I don't have to worry about that. When we baptize new believers, we are picturing our death to the old life and, the, and risen to the new. And, and that, that is something that I know every believer loves. Baptisms are so special because it's a it's a picture, and I still remember I talked to my first pastor last night. I called him up last night, and I was talking to him, and um, I just, sometimes I just remember just to, you know, even though it was 31 years ago he baptized me, I still remember, man, what a thrill, what, I, what a great experience it was um, to come to Christ. But this is an outward testimony of the inward change that, that happens to us when we receive Christ. But many Christians struggle in their daily lives because they don't understand their new identity. Who you really are. Because Satan's whispering all kind of stuff in your head. The world's telling you all kind of stuff. You, you, we see all stuff all around us. But they just don't know who they are in Christ. Man, you are, you are something special. You are special. We have to realize that being in Christ is such a radically new life. It is not... It's a supernatural life. It's not... We're no longer of this world, are we? We're in it, but we're not of it. Whatever happens to Christ happens to you. Think about that. Whatever happens to Jesus happens to you. That's why the Bible says that when Christ died, we died. 
And when Christ rose, we rose. Okay? Believers are now citizens of a new king. And look at Colossians 1.13. Colossians 1.13. He has delivered us. Did you hear that, church? You have been delivered from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. We are in a different kingdom now. You used to follow the kingdom of Satan. You used to follow his ways, didn't you? You did whatever you wanted because Satan was always there to cheer you on, to help you keep going. Yeah, brother, go, go, go. But now we have been delivered from the domain of darkness. I love the illustration I just heard. I hope I don't blow it. But I heard an illustration. If, if someone came to you or me with a gun, they pretty much would, if they told you to sit, lay, whatever, we would probably listen to them, wouldn't we? Because they... Here they have a loaded gun right at you, right at your head. You're gonna, you're gonna listen to them, aren't you? Because they have some authority, don't they? They have ha has some authority. Now you take, you find out that that gun that they're holding doesn't have any bullets anymore. They've lost their authority and it hadn't it had it now, that, now right? Now it's a, it, it ain't about. I'm not scared. Of, you got an empty gun. Okay, well that is the illustration of what happened to Satan. Jesus took his bullets from him. Now he can, only, he can only affect you by intimidation, not by authority. He has no authority over you and me. Jesus Christ has authority over you and me. Amen? Because believers, believers are now citizens of a new kingdom, and our identity is to be in line with the new king, the King Jesus. He's our king. He is the king. We're in a different kingdom. We've got to get out of this darkness, man. We've been delivered from it. Sometimes it looks like there is darkness all around us, ain't it? But we have been called to be the light of the world. That's, that's what we are. But we're also called to be Trinitarians. How many, you ever been, Trinitarians, you know what that is. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's who, that's who controls our lives. Three separate entities. Jesus Christ, the Son, the Fa God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. All three equally God. Again, I love the illustration of the pretzel. Pretzel has, it's woven into three different parts, but guess what? It's one pretzel, ain't it? And, and that, but, but I'm telling you, the, uh, the Trinity, you know, it, it, there's power in the Trinity, and we see it all throughout the Bible. Uh, from Genesis to Revelation, uh, as I read the Bible, it, it, it's there, but it's reflecting the rule of God in all that we do. Man, we got, the, we got Jesus Christ praying for us, interceding for us. We got the Holy Spirit, and we got God the Father. He's our, the, the vine dresser. Man, we got it all, man. We got everything that we need to be successful, to, to live the abundant life, but we keep letting Satan beat us down, but he has no authority over you anymore. His gun is empty. Hallelujah. So, as we help them, these people that we go to, identify with Jesus sharing the gospel message and baptizing them into the kingdom of God, and then there's a third part, the last part. We're called to teach people biblical truth. Okay? We see that in verse 20. Verse 20 of, uh, 28 of Matthew 28 says, Teaching them to observe, to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Okay, so Jesus said the goal is that people observe or obey all that he commanded us. So many Christians want information. I love information. Don't you love information? I think everybody wants information. But with that information becomes responsibility, doesn't it? When we learn something, we have to do something with it. We don't just uh, store it in our, in our little brains and then, and then let it go. But information must be combined with obedient application. Okay, that's the important part of, of applying God's word. But Jesus commands here that you are to obey the word of God. The church today has too many spiritual bulimics, okay, who take the word on Sunday and then go throw it up when they get home. That's, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about we hearing it, we're hearing it, and we're just throwing it up. We're letting it, we're letting it out. We're letting it go. And we, we're, not, we're not applying it to our daily lives. But the goal of biblical teaching is to combine information and knowledge with the skill of applying the truth in your daily life. 
And that's what we've got to do. We've got to apply this, the, the, the Word of God. But making disciples is a process. It's a process of spiritual development. And unless you are committed to being a kingdom disciple, you will not experience kingdom authority. You know, not all of us have the same kingdom authority because why would Jesus give people authority when they're not going to go tell who he is? Think about it. Why? So, look, look, look here. Jesus finished his instruction with the promise that he will be with you always. We're not doing this on our own. You, it, I can't do it and you can't do it on our own, but we're doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is not pri- talking about the promise that he will be with us always. This is not pri- primarily a generic promise to all believers, but a specific promise to the disciples and the disciple makers. Because he knows that we need him. And, and, and to have that authority, that kingdom authority, when we go out, I had this new Christian. He's only been a Christian for three years. That's pretty young. I'm 31 years old. He's three. And I sit there and listen to him, and my mouth was open that a three-year-old would be this mature, that he was talking about how he's growing in the Lord. And, and, he's, and he's sharing with me um, some of the things that are going on in his life, and I'm like, wow, he's, he's got it. And he was specifically talking about his, how he overcame pornography and how he overcame pornography. And he's two years clean of pornography. And he was talking about how he did that by putting Jesus first. And whenever thoughts of pornography came to his mind, it reminded him he would think about the fact that Jesus, Jesus. And, and, and he would, and that's how he got victory, but by putting Jesus first. And he was only one years old when he, when he got set free from pornography. One years old as a Christian. That's still a babe. He, he's a babe, but he's growing. But the greater and deeper of the discipleship, the greater the access to kingdom authority. Man, he so desperately wants to give us everything that we, we need to go out here and share Jesus Christ. I can't wait. I just really met this guy. I didn't even know his name yesterday. I can't wait to talk to him again. Um, because here's an atheist that wants, that he's interested in, in the Bible. And I was talking to him about the Bible. And, and he says, yes, I do read the Bible because I'm going to learn. He's trying to learn. He doesn't believe in God, but he, he, he wants to know why. Why? That's his question. But that's what happened to Lee Strobel, didn't it? Remember I told you about the case for Christ. If anybody's read, how many has read that book or seen that movie? Anybody? A couple people? Yeah. And Jesus does not share his rule with all believers equally, for he knows what is in our hearts. And look at John 2, 23 through 25. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name, and when he saw the signs that he, that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. And he needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. So he knows, he knows. And, and sometimes, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes, um, you know, I, 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 I look at my, some of my failures and I look at Jesus, man, I keep blowing it. Why do I keep blowing it? And, you know, just try to be honest with Jesus and, 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 and let him know when you're, you know, it, it, it hurts when you fail Jesus, when you, when you sin. It, it, it hurts because we love Jesus, and, and I know we want to be set free. But we need to, uh, an, another, another Tony Evans quote, we need to prime the pump. As J- Tony Evans says, some of us are half-stepping on Christ. And we're trying to live two worlds. You're trying to live two worlds at the same time. And how many know that you can't live in the same world, do two things at one time like that? We want to be sacred, and we want to be secular. We want to be worldly, and we want to be spiritual. We want to be... To love God and love the world. Well, guess what? Look at 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world. That's pretty clear, ain't it? That's a strong statement. Do not love the world or things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I think that is one. Did you hear how powerful that verse is? For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life 
is not from the Father, but is from the world. Leave it right there for a second. I just showed you Satan's game, his, his playbook. Satan has a playbook, and he plays it the same, the, he's playing the same play. Now, when you play football, you have a playbook. I remember when I used to be a teenager, I was into the, I used to have a playbook that, because I was a quarterback when I used to play football, and I would take my playbook with me when I was playing football so I could learn some plays, and, and I wanted to learn different plays, but, but Satan has three plays. He has um, the lust of the, the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the, and the pride of life. That's, that's what he uses to get us. It worked with Adam and Eve, and it still works today for, for us. But you know what, church? It's time to give everything you got to Jesus. That, that's my goal this year, to, to be sold out for Jesus Christ, because I can't handle the things of this world. I, I'm just being honest with you. It's, they're, they're too much for me to bear and they're too much for you to bear. This world is hard and I need Jesus Christ. I need to give everything up for him and I, I, can't, I can't let the things of this world bog me down and, and, and just take you down because they will if we, if we do it. So, it's time to be kingdom disciples. And so what is the three-step plan of Jesus? He made it really simple. What it... To follow him in his obedience. Does anybody remember what it is? What's number one? Go. We, we got to go. Let's make it easy. One word. The second thing. What else do we got to do? Baptize him. We got to baptize him, right? Okay, the last thing is to do what? Teach. Yes. So we go. We baptize. And we teach. That's Jesus. It don't get no simpler than that, does it? Go, baptize, and teach. If we follow these three simple Steps, this plan that Jesus has for us in this great scripture, we're going to see a lot of people coming to Jesus Christ. Don't you want to be a part of seeing a soul coming to know Jesus as Lord and Savior? There is nothing going to make you, get you more fired up. When, when, you're, when you're right with Jesus, seeing someone else come from the dominion of darkness and come into the kingdom of light and come into the kingdom of God, is there, it, does it get any better than that? Does it get any better? Don't you want to see, because of what, how you, um, how you uh, shared your faith and shared your love of Jesus, don't you want to see others come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior? Because church, that's what it's really, that, that is the nuts and bolts of Christianity. That's, the nuts and, that's what Jesus, that's, that's why I believe I'm still here. That's why I believe I'm still at Toyota. I, I know I'm there to make money, but man, I have a ministry there. Do you have a ministry where you work? Do you have a ministry in your community? Do you have a ministry in your home? Do you, you, you do. You, you got to, you got to, don't, don't let, don't put your Christianity on the shelf anywhere. Show it proudly. Let people know that you're not ashamed of the gospel message, that you're not ashamed of Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, I'm going to, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask something from you guys today because this is part of my challenge to you.